Well, it's great to have the opportunity to speak today. It's lovely. And to continue the series of the DNA of the church and, I guess, of people in the church. Thank you to Dennis, who's going to be helping me by reading the scriptures as we go through and we explore today's theme, which is God's favourite F word. My name's Lady. Now, we all know people who use the F word to punctuate their sentences. In fact, every word might seem to be an F word in it. I'm even surprised when I watch interviews on the BBC of all places. And there it's accepted as normal speech. And you think, is this really everyday speech? It may be that you might have used those words yourself. Perhaps in the past, or it slips out unexpectedly when you hit your shin on the bedpost, or you hit your finger and your thumb when you're doing DNI, DNI, DIY even. Perhaps you use or have used this word to fit in with other people when they use it in their culture. And it might be that it's this area of swearing that God has asked you to address. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Firstly, in exploring what the F word that God is really interested in. And secondly, in exploring what God is asking or commanding of each one of us to do. So I want to tell you a little bit more. I love words. It's my confession. They thrill me, they excite me, and I love how they're used. They can be signed in British Sign Language or Australian Sign Language, as we've now got in the church. But how we communicate, communicate with words, and my words sometimes trip up, as I've already shown. But yes, words are so important And it's interesting that God should give me this overwhelming interest in words. And yet, I need to let you into a little secret. My brain is wired a little bit differently because I have dyslexia. But I am a dyslexic who loves words. And it's just interesting how this works, because dyslexia actually just means there's a different wiring in the brain, and often those people have a more creative and a slightly different way of looking at the world. My first memory of words and trying to read was when I picked up this little book. I don't know if anybody remembers it. little ladybird book, The Lord's Prayer. And the illustrations in it are just incredible. They are very of the 1960s. Now, I was surprised um, when, when I was re-looking at this book to find that it's actually my brother's. Somehow, it was my brother's. It's got an inscription in it to him, but I've claimed it. That's my book. And I can vividly remember, as a five-year-old, struggling to read and learn the words in this book. I was on my own in the sitting room, but God was with me. The Holy Spirit was teaching me the words of the Lord's Prayer. And it was just as comforting and directly as if I'd been sitting on my mother's knee and she was talking to me. Incidentally, I wasn't diagnosed as a dyslexic until I was in my mid-30s, but that is another story. In the 1970s when I grew up, the understanding of reading and difficulties in reading weren't as honed and as as, on the spot as teachers are today. So I developed strategies and ways of learning and using my brain for reading and writing. And they were so strong that nobody realised I had a problem, although I might have been labelled lazy and stupid at different times. My mother was a teacher and head teacher, so when I was in my teens, she would go through my homework and correct it before I submitted it. So I couldn't have had a better proofreader, even if it meant I was up at five or six in the morning before school for her to go through it and for me to rewrite it. So I love words. God has a sense of humour. Have you found that? Because he's given me a job surrounded by words of an author and being a publisher. But I think God is a communicator. He's speaking new ideas And he has a sense of humour about things which make up a person. So God wants a relationship with you, with me. And to do that, he's real. God is real. Jesus is real. Holy Spirit is real. The Christians, we call it the Trinity. To me, all three, God, Jesus and Holy Spirit, are as real as you are sitting in front of me, touching you. I can touch Jesus and God and 
Holy Spirit too. God is a great communicator. He gave us words. Books are made of words. Might be an obvious statement, but let me expand a little. This book, the Holy Bible, God has given us 727,969 words in the NIV version. Obviously, the amplified version, there's a lot more. So in context, in a novel that you might read, there's 70 to 90,000 words. So it's, you know, your usual novels are about a tenth of what's in here. But I love it because if I love God, this has got to be my favorite book. And it contains everything I need for life. It's as though God is whispering. I don't know. Can you hear him? He whispers to you through his word. But it's like a new language. Because it's a special language, just for you, just for me, that God gives. And he speaks directly through this to your heart. And why do I think that God has a special language in the Bible? Because it's written in English for us, isn't it? Or German for Helga or Suzanne. Or Scottish for Bob Durden. Or Cockney for Richard. Whatever your native language is, you know, those words are written for you. A little while back in the church, we had a visit from Richard Young from the Wycliffe Bible Translations. He spoke about his work in accessing the Holy Bible for as many languages as he could. So we consider the kind of languages that God puts there so we can understand him. Currently... Or as of October 2018, the full Bible had been translated into 683 languages. The New Testament had been translated into an additional 1,534 languages. And Bible portions or stories into 1,133 other languages. Thus, at least some portion of the Bible has been translated into 3,350 languages. Who can say that God isn't interested in communicating with us? Can you imagine what it was like in the first century when we only had the Bible in Latin and only the learned priests were able to translate it for us? Or not so long ago, the majority of people were illiterate, so the only way they could hear passages was by attending church and listening to the Bible that way. Now we have electronic versions and it's adapted so everyone can get the Bible in their words. I love words. I love about God's language is that he uses words in radically different ways. Very different to how maybe the world or people who don't know God uses words. It's a secret language for us, for those who love him. For instance, the word word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Word was with God in the beginning. Word means Jesus. You won't find that in the dictionary. The dictionary definition says... Word. Noun. A single distinctive meaningful element of speech or writing. Shown with a space either side when written or printed. Or, two, a command, password or signal. No mention of Jesus. Not a surprise, I guess. But interesting. So does it mean that there are some meanings God has for us in words in the Bible for just those who read it? And our help for understanding what those words mean come from the Holy Spirit. So what is God's favorite F word? Is it family? my family. Is it friendship? Is it faith? I'd love to go into each one of those words so much, but I need to concentrate on what I believe his favorite is, and that is fear. Now, I've got this picture up of two hands, an older one, a mum, a dad maybe, with a baby touching and clunching round that index finger. Does that really give you an image of fear? When you look at that picture, do you think of fear? What does it portray to you? 
love, wonder of new life, awesomeness, amazement, delight, hope, or perhaps fear of the Lord. Because fear of the Lord has a different context. Have you ever played the word association game in in the car? You know, if someone says a word and someone else says a word associated with that word and then someone says another word associated with that word, it carries on until the word is repeated, then that person is out. Well, fear, when you hear it for the first time or see it, you have to consider its context. Does it mean fear as in being afraid? Or does it mean fear of the Lord? If it's fear of the Lord, does this mean being afraid of God? I would say emphatically, no. It's not a state of mind that God wants for us to be afraid. Because if he speaks to us and indeed sends somebody like an angel to us, or a messenger, we can't hear if we're in a state of being frightened. So there's a difference between human fear and godly fear. And fear of the Lord in the Bible. This is what I love about this book. The words aren't always what you think they're going to be. There's over 300 references of fear in the Bible in context with God. And a lot of the times when an angel appears, the first thing he says is, do not be afraid, do not fear. And I'm sure you can think of lots of examples yourself. But fear of the Lord is different because it's about respect and honour and love. I wrote a book called I'm Frozen in 2014, and there's an in-depth chapter on the fear of love in it. And within that, I was asking people, what do you think of? What says to you fear of the Lord? And Penel Durden, and I asked her, this is what she said. I'm overawed by his majesty. I believe his love for everyone is a mystery especially as we all get so much wrong. His timely direction to keep me and others on the right path and his forgiveness when we choose an alternative is unlike any relationship or friendship with anyone else. So isn't it interesting already there's a different concept of what fear of the Lord looks like. So let's look a little bit more in depth in the Bible to say what what the Bible tells us about fear of the Lord. I don't know if anyone recognises this depiction of who, who this is in the, in the Bible. It's supposed to be Isaiah. And in Isaiah 11, 1, 2, 3, the prophet is describing the shoot that will become the sprout from the stump of Jesse. It says, The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. So who is Isaiah talking about when he puts this together? He's actually talking about Jesus. So we're back to the word, Jesus, again. And these words were written by the prophet Isaiah, and they believe it was written 700 years before Jesus was born. And we often hear this particular quote, this particular verse, at Christmas time, as it foretells the coming of Jesus. And God was saying that Jesus would have fear of the Lord. So it cannot mean be afraid. God delighted in Jesus and will delight in us too when we follow Jesus' example of fearing God. And to demonstrate this meaning of fear, let me tell you a couple of stories. First one is Moses. Now we quite familiar with the story of Moses. And from Exodus, we we are at a point now where he's brought all the hundreds and thousands out of Israel, saved them, and they're in the desert to begin their journey round and round. And when he was in the desert, um, his father-in-law had heard about all the amazing things that Moses had done, his speaking with God, you know, all those things. And he said, I'm going to go and, and, and see him, see for myself what's going on out there. And when Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, comes, he's greeted, and they meet up, and I'm sure they had great, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. So it was wonderful. And the very next day, 
Moses started to do what he would do. So he was there, he was judging the people, people were coming to him with this issue and that issue, and, and Jethro was watching it all. And I'm sure at one point, Moses might be, oh, look what I'm doing, aren't I? You know. And Jethro said, this isn't good, Moses. This is not good. You're doing too much. You are really, you need to de-stress because if you carry on like this, you're going to burn out. And you've got to concentrate on what God wants you to do. And it's not dealing with the nth degree of what all the people want from you. So you need to select some people to help you, to delegate. There might be a hint there for anybody else listening too. So in Exodus 18, he says, Select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. So, you see, this is the great advice that Jethro gave. It wasn't, oh, get your accountants there, get the people who are good with administration, get your people. You know, it's like Andy said in his sermon a couple of while ago on a different subject, but it's the same thing was when you select people to do the work of God, choose ones that fear him. Because if they fear God, they're going to be on board to do all the great things. The other person who really knew God was King David. Now, David was known as the God, as the man after God's own heart. And I love the words which are retold in Samuel about what David actually said on his deathbed. He said, When one rules over men in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of the morning at sunrise, on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings the grass from the earth. I mean, that is just so poetic, as only David kind of says, and great leadership advice. And can you imagine on your deathbed, what are the words you're going to say? If you're going to pass your wisdom of your life onto the next generation, and his was, you need to rule in the fear of God. So why do I find the fear of God so important? It's quite simply... Because God asks us to do this. It actually is a command as much as the Ten Commandments. God wants this. And do you do what God asks you to do? So the Lord God commanded us to observe, obey all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good way, for our good always, and for our survival as it is today. So it's interesting, isn't it? You know, I've gone through all the things you know, Paul says we should do, evangelism and use the gifts of the Spirit. But I come back to this, that God actually says he wants us to fear him and fear him in the fullness of that word. Now, when you fear him, you prosper and you can live great life. So let's look at a few more stories in the Bible which tells us about this. If we come to Exodus 1, we've got a story there of the midwives midwives in Exodus, in Egypt, the pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is saying to them, I don't want any more Jewish boys born. I, I really want to wipe out some of this race. So he told the midwives that the Jewish midwives, they had to kill any boy born to a Jewish woman. And they were in fear of their own lives if they disobeyed. But did they disobey? Yes, they did. And why? And because the midwives feared God... He gave them families of their own. Another story is about this gorgeous chap called Cornelius. And he is at the other end of the, Testament, of the Bible. He's in the New Testament. And it's in Acts. Jesus has been crucified, died and risen. And Cornelius was a centurion in the Italian regiment. And he was stationed in Caesarea. The Apostle Paul was visiting in that area, and it was just before Peter gets told to go and visit Cornelius. And it would have been the first for Peter to visit a Gentile, someone who was not a Jew. Cornelius was well known in his community. He, as a centurion, was in charge of over 100 men, and he was known as being devout and God-fearing and generous for those who are in need and actually praying to God. And one afternoon, he had a visit from an angel. Angel said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. 
What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have brought you to God's attention. The story develops more. But I just want to look at those words because I've heard sermons talking about this story and saying that Cornelius was afraid because that's what it says, you know. He stared at the angel in fear. But I disagree because fear in this content, I think, means honour and respect because the angel did not say, do not fear, do not be afraid. So that, that's where I put that fear in that context. And have you noticed that when you fear the Lord, God blesses them. God blesses those people and he will bless you and you fear him too. Two more quotes from the Bible. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So let's have a quick reminder of Deuteronomy 6.24. So the Lord our God commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. So my question is, when you're asked, or dare I say commanded, by someone to do something, do you do it? What's your reaction? It might be, it depends on who asks you. So, if a stranger asks you to do something, do you do it? If your next door neighbour asks you to do something, what's your view? If a policeman, a special like Rod, or a judge asks you to do it, do you do it? If your brother or sister asks you, what's your reaction? If your child asks you, do you give what they're asking? If your minister, like Mark, asks you to do something, do you do it? If the person you love most in the world asks you to do something, do you do it unquestionably or do you have to still wait? So what about God's ask? If you fear him today and he asks you to do something, will you do it? Now there is a small caveat around this. Because the fear of the Lord really is only relevant to you if you have a relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship to God, then you can't be expected to obey him. That might be need some thinking through. But if you remember, it's still part of this secret language between God and his people. God and his children, you and me. If you went into church, into work tomorrow... And you spoke to a work colleague and you said, we all have to fear the Lord. What do you think their reaction is going to be? They're going to think, you're bonkers. They will hear the word fear and immediately go to the definition of being afraid. And I don't want to be afraid of anybody. I'm not going to worship that person. Why should I be afraid? You can kind of hear it now. If they are not in a relationship with the Lord, then this particular command is meaningless to them. Because the Holy Spirit hasn't explained it to them yet. If you don't have a relationship, this is something you might want to explore. Exodus 23 says to fear God is the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. It is, in fact, the most, commandment, most important commandment of them all. Number one. Jesus was asked what is the, most, the biggest commandment. And he replied in the same words same meaning of the words, but his words. And he said, To love the Lord our God, to love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. See, this is what the fear of the Lord is all about. It's the first commandment and it's all aligned with love. So when you see, when you read fear in the Bible, check it out. It might well be God's favourite F word. Because fear of the Lord equals love. Jesus wants to know more about you. He wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to be in relationship with you. So if this is hit a point, come and chat with me. Come and talk to someone with a yellow badge on like Debbie. And her lovely husband. (laughs) 
So do you want to stand up so people can see you? Have a chat with them. They've got the yellow badges. Other people might have yellow badges. Talk to them. Talk to me. Talk to Chris. We'd love to hear from you and share with you what we know about the fear of, of the Lord, fear of God, and what changes is made into our lives and what changes it can make into yours. Thank you.